when I went through the simulation, I decided that it was better to take the strike on the ground-based system and know that you, of course, if you need to do a, a response strike, you still have bombers, you still have submarines and so forth, then to risk being the first, you know, to launch those mm. preemptively and, and risk making an error. That's the voice of David E. Sanger, national security correspondent and senior writer with The New York Times. Sanger's book, The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage, and Fear in the Cyber Age, is the basis of a new HBO documentary. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. We are officially two weeks out from the upcoming U.S. elections. That's right, Michelle. And it's also an important day for New Start watchers. The Trump administration, of course, could still withdraw from New Start. But as of today, even if Trump does, a new administration coming into office in January could reverse it given the three-month waiting period that is part of the deal. And we talk about the policy of New START withdrawal and extension, and we also break down the new North Korean ICBM and more on this week's early warning. Afterwards, we are excited to give you the very first interview led by our new president, Dr. Emma Belcher. She sits down with the New York Times' David Sanger as the two of them discuss mind-altering drugs, presidential sole authority, and the nexus between nuclear weapons and the emerging age of cyber conflict. It's a fantastic interview, and we promise you'll be hearing much more from Emma. In the meantime, be sure to watch David Sanger's terrific new documentary, The Perfect Weapon, which is all about the rise of cyber warfare and cyber spying on an international scale and was just released last Friday on HBO. And finally, I answer a question on what a new administration can do on arms control on this week's Q&A segment. Remember, if you want your question answered on the air, tweet or DM us at press button pod or send us an email at pressthebutton at plowshares.org, and we would really like to hear from you. As always, please click the subscribe button and give us a rating. We do this podcast for you, our listeners, and your support means the world. With that said, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thank you, Dell. Last week, we saw two major developments on two key issues, the New START Treaty and North Korean missiles. And here today, we have two experts to help us understand what is going on. Alexandra Bell is the Senior Policy Director at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. And Melissa Hannum is the Deputy Director at the Open Nuclear Network. Thank you both so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Alex, let's start with you. Uh, Last week, Russian President Putin offered to extend New START for one year without conditions. This should have been welcomed by the Trump administration as a pragmatic way to avoid the collapse of New START and buy time to negotiate a follow-on agreement. Uh, Instead, the Trump administration rejected the offer. The Trump administration's arms control envoy, Marshall Billingsley, said, quote, the United States made every effort, unquote. And National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said, quote, we hope that Russia will reevaluate its position before a costly arms race ensues, unquote. So, Alex, to you, tell us, in your view, what happened here and who should we blame? Uh, Tom, it's it's hard to actually, you know, even fathom what the the Trump administration is doing here. Uh, for years, they they punted on doing anything in in this uh, arena, saying that they wanted to wait until we, um, you know, hit the required levels under the treaty, and then they would start working. They wanted to make sure that the Russians were complying. Uh, and then they punted further, saying they wanted, you know, maybe China to be in an agreement and 
you know, all the while saying they had all the time in the world. I remember actually being at a, at a public P5 meeting before uh, the lockdown started. And I actually asked the American official, you know, <laughs> when are we going to be, you know, sort of in a time crunch here? You keep saying you have all the time in the world. And, and, and there was just sort of a general pushback of like, no, there, you know, we've got all this time. And so now we're in a position where they probably started taking this mildly serious somewhere around the summertime. Um, but only in the sense that they started actually having meetings. Uh, the U.S. put out these completely unacceptable set of demands. This wasn't a negotiation. This was just the U.S. saying, here's what we want, um, and, and then pitching a fit that the Russians didn't say yes. That's not how arms control works. Both sides um, you know, have to be listening to each other's concerns. So we're now in a situation where we're you know, just a few months away from possibly losing the last guardrail uh, against, uh, you know, an all out arms race, you know, which could be possible. Uh, Ambassador Billingsley already threatened to spend China and Russia into oblivion. Um, I don't know that we have an oblivion's worth of money uh, to spend on a needless arms race, uh, much less, you know, during the midst of an economic and, and health crisis in this country and around the world. So, uh, I, you know, I hate to be, you know, laying blame. It's sort of like the animal farm quote about, you know, everyone is equal, but some are more equal than others. Mm -hmm. I would say at this point, everyone is to blame for this situation. The U.S. is a little bit more to blame right now um, because uh, President Trump could extend New Start today uh, and it would be a win. And, and he would get accolades from around the world, including from his competitor, Vice President Biden, who would be sure uh, to uh, compliment the president on doing this very basic thing. Thanks. And so what happens next? Do you think New START will be ultimately extended? I hope it will be. I, I hope that President Trump, again, today would decide that this was the right thing to do, uh, extend the treaty for the maximum amount of time available, which is five years, and then work on these bigger ideas. Everybody supports the idea of getting China into an arms control agreement, getting their arms around the Russian tactical arsenal. But that takes time and discipline and patience uh, and it's not going to be done, you know, through a series of, of you know, bullying Twitter posts. It's a, uh, it's something that's going to take time. You know, if the president doesn't extend it, um, and he isn't reelected, Biden would have, uh, if he is elected, would have up, uh, around 16 days with which to extend the treaty uh, with the Russians. He's already made it clear he wants to do that. Putin has already noted that Vice President Biden said he would want to do that. So. Uh, there's hope yet. Um, it just it defies logic and reason not to extend this treaty. It's, it's just whoever is president, that's what they should do. Thank you very much. And Melissa, now turning to you. Last week, during a major military parade, North Korea revealed its largest intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, to date. Uh, and as we know, North Korea has already tested two other ICBM. So, so first, tell us what is this? How would it differ from North Korea's other missiles? And where is it in development? Thanks for having me, Tom. And Alex is always a tough act to follow. I'll do my best. Uh, so uh, at the strike of midnight, uh, North Korea started what was a really well choreographed parade with a, 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 an emotional speech from its leader. And one by one, new pieces of equipment came rolling out. And at the very end was this just enormous missile, surely one of the largest liquid fueled missiles ever, um, especially since it was being carried on a yet to be seen truck. But I think it sort of underlines the fact that North Korea hasn't actually taken a big technological move to go into solid fuel missiles, staying with what it knows. Um, and really, you know, what we remember from them doing in the 70s and 80s was taking the Scud missile and reverse engineering it into a Hwasong uh, missile that we, we often refer to as Nodongs. And uh, in this case, um, you know, they've already tested their engines um, for the Hwasong 15. Um, what we're seeing here is still a two-stage missile, just much, much larger. And there are some small indications on the parade photo that what we may have is a configuration of four engines in the first stage of the missile. So really what you're having happen here is that it's not distinctly different design from the Hwasong 15, which they, 
already can deliver a single nuclear warhead anywhere in the continental U.S., but now they can deliver either a farther range, which they don't need to do, or they can deliver more weight to that same distance. So what we're thinking they're doing is either now getting ready to deliver multiple nuclear warheads to the United States or that they're planning on a new super heavy warhead. Although I, I, they don't have any testing set up right now for that kind of thing. So while I can't rule it out, it, my, my preferred theory is that they're getting ready for multiple warheads and um, all the sort of uh, penetration aids you would expect from uh, a missile that would overwhelm or confuse U.S. ballistic missile defense. And as far as you know, this missile has not yet been tested. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. This missile has not been tested. So it's just a parade right now. That being said, uh, they gave quite a few high resolution photos and it looks like they put in a lot of work into this missile. In the past, there are definitely times and even in this parade, there are times when we thought they were showing a mock-up for a parade but some of the machining required for this missile makes me think that it's, um, while, while it may not be deployed anytime soon, um, that it is intended to be a very real missile. And the next step would be for us to see it tested. Got it. Well, listen, I would uh, love to keep having this conversation. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap this up. The sirens are blaring, but we're going to have to have you both back uh, again on the show to discuss these issues at greater depth. So Alex and Melissa, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks. Thank you. Cyber is the most inexpensive, highly destructive, highly deniable weapon. You don't see the war but war is taking place. For decades, there was a lot of cyber theft, but everything would change in 2007. A piece of malware would be delivered into the Iranian nuclear program. The United States used a powerful cyber weapon in a very aggressive way. And others began to say, if the Americans can do it, so can we. Welcome everybody to Press the Button. I'm sitting here today with David Sanger, a national security correspondent and senior writer with the New York Times. He's been on three Pulitzer Prize winning teams over the course of his 36 year career. David's newest book, The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage and Fear in the Cyber Age, examines the emergence of cyber conflict as the primary way in which large and small states are competing with each other. It's the subject of a just released fantastic HBO documentary, also called The Perfect Weapon, that came out last Friday. David, thanks so much for being here. Great to be with you, Emma. Terrific. So before we get to your documentary, I'd like to talk to you about a recent piece you wrote, wrote with William Board for the New York Times about presidential sole authority. Now, this was in the wake of coverage of President Trump's bout with coronavirus where it was revealed he was taking a cocktail of experimental drugs, some of which can be mood altering. Now in your piece you wrote, Mr. Trump's critics have long questioned whether his unpredictable statements and contradictions pose a nuclear danger. But the concerns raised last week were somewhat different. Whether a president taking mood altering drugs could determine whether a nuclear alert was a false alarm. Now tell us, why is this issue so important and what moved you to write about it? So what moved me to write about it was this, that um, the president's doctors came out and described a steroid that, he, that they were trying out on him. Uh, our COVID and medical uh, correspondents were digging into that and found that in you know, roughly 30% of the cases, it can cause delusions, it can make it difficult for you to have good judgment, um, it can lead to thoughts of, of great grind and grandeur, you know, delusions mm -hmm. of grandeur. Um, you can imagine Donald Trump with delusions of grandeur. How could that possibly happen? Right. Uh, and um, it sort of raised a question that was separate and apart from President Trump, which is the 25th Amendment calls for the voluntary transfer of power 
by the president to the vice president, if the president knows that they're basically not going to be in a position to go deal with things, right? So uh, George W. Bush did this twice when he got a colonoscopy and he knew he was going to be under general anesthesia. His father did it once, uh, I believe, and certainly Ronald Reagan did it when he went in for a somewhat routine operation. So we have a history of saying, okay, we can't have a period of time where the one person with sole authority over nuclear weapons basically is out of it. So why was it that there wasn't a transfer here if there's a decent chance that these drugs cause you to have uh, absence of judgment? And so apart from the cases we had there, some historians pointed us to Kennedy, who had, remember, had a lot of back pain and as a result yep. took mm-hmm. some fairly strong drugs for that and, and so forth. Um, we went to the White House and asked the question, so what about this? They didn't want to answer it. They didn't want to raise the topic because they didn't want to raise any of the 25th Amendment questions and so forth. Um, so there we were. And I just thought that in the midst of the COVID coverage, this had just never been sort of played out. So Bill and I, Bill Broad and I decided we would sort of try to try to step out the, the issues. And the fundamental one is that we're in an era where you know how quickly one has to make decisions if there is a nuclear alert. But we also know that there are mistakes. Think of the Hawaii alert, right? Mm-hmm. wasn't real, but right? there are cyber spoofs right? The main concern a lot of people have now is that your system would be would uh, be wiped out in a cyber attack or fooled in a cyber attack. And thus, you thought you were responding to something, but you were actually initiating a first strike. And yep. all of those re- require you to go ask a lot of questions and really be at the top of your game. And even then you can make mistakes. You mentioned that this isn't the first time where they've made that decision to delegate some authority uh, given their potential ability not to think clearly enough. And I, I think the other instance, the famous one, is of Richard Nixon's presidency when he was rumoured to be drinking heavily. Is this story at all similar to what happened this month with Trump? A little bit different because mm-hmm. when you're going into the drugs, you know that you're headed into the drive, right? And the story about Nixon right. is that he was drinking heavily at the very end of his presidency as he was contemplating resignation. And the story that was put out by James Schlesinger, who was the defense secretary at the time, was that he had issued instructions that if there was a significant military move, certainly a nuclear move, it should be routed through him or through Henry Kissinger, uh, who was secretary of state uh, at the time. Uh, I'm sorry, was National Security Advisor at the time, right. and that was not quite yet appointed Secretary of State. That was under Ford. Nobody's ever really been able to go nail this down because um, Schlesinger sticks by his story, but it, he would not have legal authority within the formal chain of command. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, I've asked Kissinger about it. Kissinger said it didn't really ring a, a bell with him. It didn't, you know, he's heard the story, but doesn't have any recollection that it came up at the moment. So um, we know that there was a concern there, but I can't tell you if it was a current concern or an ex post facto concern. Right. Extrapolating from that and the Schlesinger claim, would that have been the case here? Would we have had someone um, behind the scenes who might have uh, wanted to prevent any kind of uh, Trump authorization to uh, launch a strike? Um, even though it would be unconstitutional to do so, do we think we'd have people in the background who would be um, trying to prevent something like that from happening? They could be, but, you know, when you look at the way the law is set up, when you look at the way the tradition is set up, and when you look at where the chain of command is set up, their options are somewhat limited. Um, The, the, National Military Command Center has to authenticate that it's it's a uh, a real order from the president, and that's why the president's got that little card, that token that you know you've got to read out a certain code, and that changes all the all the time. I have this image in my mind that, like your bank, you know, they send something back to your cell phone, but I think it's better than that, <laughs> uh, right? And um, uh, that's though just to determine whether it's truly the president at the other end of the line. 
it's mm. not there to make an al- to to be an alternative set of judgments if it actually is the president. And that's why there's been all this discussion. Bill Perry's led a good deal of it, the former defense secretary under Bill Clinton, sort of the dean of American nuclear strategists, that we shouldn't have sole authority. And, you know, if you believe what we understand or we're told about the Russian system, even Vladimir Putin doesn't have sole authority. There are There's a committee of three and there's got to be a vote of two out of three. Now, I wouldn't want to think what would happen to you if you were the one, the dissenter in that group, but, you know. So then how do you think we should be thinking about sole authority here in the United States? Well, it certainly needs a lot of rethinking, Um, partly because the opportunities to get spoofed are so much more subtle now than they were at the beginning of the nuclear age. So the president may just need sort of additional help and time partly because presidents don't tend to drill this a huge amount. I mean, we know that, that President Obama did. I, we don't know if, if President Trump has. Um, you know, during the Munich Security Conference this year, uh, just before the, the coronavirus lockdown, they were running a simulation that was being done uh, by a group out of uh, Princeton University and that whole uh, nuclear crowd there, where you basically went into a virtual reality space and you had the time pressure and the ringing alarms and people telling you that missiles were coming in. I went through the, the whole thing. And wow. basically you had to make a decision. Do you launch your ground-based uh, weapons or risk losing them? And there were little hints in the thing that maybe you know, there's something inconsistent in the data, but you had to be listening pretty carefully for it. Certainly nothing you'd want to be doing if you were on mood enhancing drugs of any kind or mood changing drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, you know, everybody comes to their own decision. When I went through the simulation, I decided it was better to take the strike on the ground-based system and know that you, of course, if you need to do a, a response strike, you still have bombers, you still have submarines and so forth, then to risk being the first, you know, to launch those mm. preemptively and, and risk making an error. Well, I think this is a terrific segue, actually, David, to um, the next topic of cyber and uh, how it relates to the terrific new HBO documentary, The Perfect Weapon, that's based on your book about this emerging area of cyber conflict. Um, You'd mentioned before the possibility of cyber spoofs uh, interfering with the nuclear system. Um, And, you know, clearly cyber relates to nuclear uh, in a way that I think uh, we're just really beginning to understand. Um, Before we get into talking about the documentary a bit further, um, what are the main concerns that you would have right now with respect to cyber and nuclear? So the main concern is this. We are doing a long overdue upgrade of our systems, right? So you've seen, particularly for the ground-based systems, you've seen the pictures, you know, the leaky silos, the five-inch disks, you know, Mm -hmm. that are left over from the old computer systems. I mean, can you imagine showing up at Office Depot and saying you need to go (laughs) replace some five-inch... I don't even know where they get those things anymore. No, right. right. I had them in college, but that was a few years ago, Emma. Okay. Um, (laughs) So um, the first concern is that as you modernize, you run the risk of introducing new vulnerabilities because suddenly you've got a digitized network system. And how did the internet become vulnerable in general? because it was never built for that kind of security at the beginning. And then, of course, we put trying to layer security on later mm-hmm. on onto a highway that was never sort of built for that. Now, there are a lot of very smart people who have seen this coming. The National Security Agency, while you think of it as a code breaking and eavesdropping operation, they're also a code assurance operation, and they're deeply involved in the nuclear upgrades as well. But Everything from insider threat to data in transit all introduce opportunities for some kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it could be even more complicated than it ever was before for a president to go, 
even detect that there is a signals issue here. You know, Bill Perry tells a great story. It's in his memoir from when he was undersecretary, I think, for science and engineering, in which uh, he gets woken up in the middle of the night and uh, a duty officer says, sir, we're not entirely sure we may, something may be wrong here, but we have, you know, we're seeing hundreds of incoming missiles. And it was not a period of great um, geopolitical tension with the Soviet Union at that particular time. And it just didn't sound right. They hadn't gotten to the point of waking up the president yet, but they were thinking about it because time was ticking down and they got to wake up the president in time to be able to have enough time to make a decision and, and so forth. And it turned out that somebody had put a training tape into the real live system and the training tape had in it an incoming attack. It was a completely fake attack, right? It was something that just came out of our own effort to, to, to train our own uh, workers. So you can imagine that in a networked and digital age, all of that could happen much faster and might be harder to, t to find because you're not actually looking for a, a physical tape that got put in a system. So, you know, I think that's one aspect of how cyber interacts with nuclear. And in your documentary, The Perfect Weapon, you claim that this new era of cyber conflict started with the Stuxnet computer worm that the US and Israel allegedly built to cripple the Iranian nuclear program during the Bush uh, and Obama years. So in the documentary, you say... Until then, countries were using cyber to steal data to spy on each other, but almost no one had used cyber as an offensive weapon. And you go on to say that by using cyber in this way, America had crossed the Rubicon. The United States had basically legitimized the use of cyber as a weapon against another country against whom you had not declared war. It pushed the world into an entirely new territory. So what is it that made the Stuxnet worm so unique from what had come before? And why did it push the world into new territory? Well, it pushed into new territory because Stuxnet was a case. And Stuxnet, by the way, was a name that the industry later gave the actual code. The mm -hmm. code name of the operation was Olympic Games. Right. And, uh, and Olympic Games was an effort to try to stop the Iranians from being able to enrich uranium without bombing them, which would, of course, led to a general war in the Middle East, or probably would have, and without having to send saboteurs in on the ground, which would have been incredibly dangerous had they been caught there. And uh, so this is a story that I told in Confront and Conceal, uh, a previous book, which described the decision-making in the Bush and Obama administrations, because it spanned the two of them, in the situation room to go ahead and try this, even with the awareness that President Obama frequently mentioned to his staff that once it got out, because they knew eventually this would get out, I don't think they planned it to get out as quickly as the New York Times and others made happen, right? Uh, but that once it got out, every other country in the world that is engaged in cyber activity against the United States would use it as an excuse to say, look, the Americans are doing it, so why not us? And of course, that's exactly what's happened. Yeah. And we use it in the film because it was exactly a decade ago, the summer of 2010, that the Stuxnet worm got loose and got out and started our investigation into what happened. And that has been the decade of huge acceleration in cyber attacks. And I think one of the things you'll notice in the documentary is that the pace of the documentary picks up as time goes on, just the, 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 the timing of what you're seeing. And that is to reflect the fact that the volume and sophistication of attacks have picked up in these past few years. You know, it's sort of like a pandemic, you know, in that way, and that it starts with a small number of cases and then horseshoes up. Yeah, I did actually notice that. Um, I thought it was a terrific documentary, by the way, un as unnerving as it was. And I think part of the unnerving feeling was seeing uh, all of this really ratchet up and thinking about the potential implications. Obviously, a big part of this discussion on cyber conflict really has to relate back to the 2016 presidential elections in the United States, also in the context of the presidential elections that we have coming up uh, in just a few weeks. And thinking about the really sophisticated cyber campaigns that the Russians ran, 
in part to delegitimise faith in democracy and the government. And I, I wanted to sort of focus in on an important part of that discussion. In the documentary, you talk about the Russians having created what is called a perception hack. And you say our mind immediately goes to the question, are the Russians messing with the election? And it doesn't really matter if they are or they aren't. So what is this perception hack and how did the Russians exploit it so effectively? Well, we're beginning to learn more about it, perception hacks, but the concept of a perception hack is essentially that you do something fairly small, but the very fact that you have done it, Emma, makes people think that you've got a much broader attack underway, right? I mean, sort of in the physical world, think of like, you know, Patton uh, going with sort of a, a fake force that looked like it was going to launch D-Day from a different place from where D-Day was actually launched, right? It was all a, a sort of psychological fake out. Now move that to the cyber equivalent. You don't need to get into every registration system and e-poll book system in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or name your, your battleground state. All you need to do, Emma, is get into a couple of cities and towns that are badly protected. And then word gets out that, you know, Emma has shown up at her polling place and she was told, oh, um, we have you listed in Chicago, not here. You know, did you move? And, and then you begin to think, OK, somebody's messing with the registration system. And of course, in the 2016 elections, we know that the Russians got into the registration systems of just about every state in the country. But we haven't found any evidence that they actually manipulated data. But we're sitting there in the concern. So if you can manipulate it in a couple of cities and towns, then someone could stand up and say, well, all of the state of Wisconsin is infected. We'll have to throw out all those ballots. And who might that someone be? I mean, you've already got a president saying that this is going to be a fraudulent election. It's being rigged against him. So a little bit of evidence that something was going wrong could lead to this. And there's a moment in the film where we take you to Iowa on caucus evening. So what happened in Iowa? They decided for the first time that they would use iPhones and an electronic method to basically try to, to um, gather caucus data and bring people together, some of them virtually. It makes perfect sense. You get a lot of bad weather in Iowa in the middle of the winter, which is when the, when the primaries happen. So, of course, they hadn't fully tested the system. And it fell apart, you know, in its, like, first contact with the voter, right? And it was a complete mess. Now, did the Russians have anything to do with it? No. It was, this was purely, right. What was everyone's first thought? Oh, my God, the Russians are in the system. The other day, it was the last day to register in the state of Virginia to register for votes. And their entire registration system went down for three or four hours. And everyone thought, oh, are the Russians in the registration system? My phone's ringing, you know, all that. No, somebody cut through a telecommunications line with a backhoe while they were, you know, working on some piece of construction. It was a perfectly innocent explanation, right? But you can see what what people's minds would go to. Now, you know, take this to the supercharged moment of a battleground state on November 3, and you've got something that could be pretty explosive. Right. And something that might not need to actually be done by the Russians, but we're already at a state where the perception and the concern and the way that you've just outlined has already done enough to uh, sow fear and, and doubt. So so supposing you had something happen that wasn't done by the Russians, you know, the equivalent of the idiot with the backhoe, right? Uh, someplace, you know, mm. idiot. I mean, he would, nobody did deliberately, right? But, um, uh, but you know, you have, you have a, an accident like that and some Russian hacking group takes credit for it, okay? The way a terrorist group might take credit for a natural gas explosion someplace, so we, we play with this a little bit in the, in the documentary. Um, documentary is about more than just voting hacks. It's about um, the concerns uh, that you're inside the electrical grid. 
And again, perception hacks can happen because you don't have to be everywhere in the grid. You can be in just a few parts of it. We reported, uh, Nicole Perlroth and I, a year and a half ago, that the United States was so concerned about code inside the American electric grid that it put code intended to be seen inside the Russian electrical grid. You may remember this story because the president tweeted out that we had committed a virtual act of treason. And then he tweeted out that the story was wrong. So we had to say to them, well, you have to pick, you know, either we're treasonous or the story's wrong, in which case we didn't commit treason. But, you know, um, uh, and in fact, we had gone to his administration and told them what we were getting ready to publish. And they didn't have any particular problem with it because they had intended for the Russians to see the code. Why would you intend to see for the Russians to see the code? To enact your own perception hack to sort of say, mess with us inside our grid. It'd be a shame if all the electricity went off in St. Petersburg. So switching over to one of the other major cyber actors in this century, you spend the last part of the documentary talking about China and its method of cyber conflict, and especially its linkages to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And um, you say in the documentary, the way jet fighter designs might have been a decade ago, coronavirus has become the holy grail. Because the country that wins the race for the vaccine and the treatment of COVID-19 will become a new kind of power, able to spread that vaccine around the world. So this is really interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about what the Chinese are doing and why it's important for the future of geopolitics? Sure. So the race a decade and a half ago was who could get the stealth fighter, right? If you had the stealth fighter and your planes couldn't be seen, you had a great edge. And of course, the Chinese famously stole our stealth fighter designs. I was with Secretary Robert Gates when he went to China on a trip, oh, more than a decade ago. And uh, on that trip, the uh, Chinese happened to test fly their stealth fighter, which looks a lot like our stealth fighter for the first time. With saying, okay, we've got it too, my friend, right? Right. In the current age, if you had to decide what's more important to get your intelligence agencies to steal jet fighter designs or to get them to steal COVID-19 vaccines, there's no question. To the Chinese this year, COVID-19 vaccines would be far more important, not only because they want to go uh, inoculate their own population, but because they want to be able to go use it to spread their soft power influence around the world. So if you've got a group of countries, even maybe NATO members or European Union members or African or Latin American countries or whatever, and they're looking and they're saying, okay, so America's policy is going to be America first. So that means they're going to put the vaccine in the arms of Americans first. Right. And here are the Chinese coming along offering, you know, that um, we can get the vaccine. Their vaccine might not be perfect, but we can get it and get it in everyone's arm. And all we have to do to do that is sign up for their Huawei 5G uh, networks. And maybe they'll throw in a little facial recognition along the way. You can see the power of the technology, both of a cyber and of a biomedical uh, uh, nature to sort of be an, an, a significant agent of influence. Now, we did this in the Cold War as well. You know, the Peace Corps would come out and help inoculate kids, and we helped spread uh, vaccines to eradicate smallpox and so forth and so on. But right now, the Chinese can sort of play off of a perception that America is not in its most generous mood. So uh, just finally, something that struck me about the documentary was just how up to date it was um, and how recent some of these issues um, that are in the documentary, how, how um, not very long ago they happened. So what I'm wondering is since you finished the documentary, has anything sprung up that, um, that our listeners should be aware about? Um, and what do you see coming up over the horizon that's maybe in addition to the, the COVID-19 um, issue? 
Well, Emma, you've, you've known me. I'm a news reporter. So the whole idea that you would lock something up and then have a long space and time before you released it and make it feel out of date, that, that's not me, right? So yeah. even when I do my books, you know, we're careful to not close them until just the very last moment that we can get away with, usually to the screaming of editorial employees at the, at the book publisher. Um, here we just closed the documentary, you know, maybe a month ago. Right. And there's one thing that has happened that, you know, if it was still open, I probably would have tried to, to, to shoehorn in, uh, which is that um, the United States government and a group of companies led by Microsoft working independently without knowledge of each other, both worked to bring down the trick bot set of tools that were being used by Russian speaking. We don't know if they are Russian, but Russian speaking um, hackers. Now, until now, TrickBot has been used mostly for ransomware. And, you know, ransomware is when you go in and you basically lock up the computer systems of a city or town. It happened to Baltimore. It happened to Atlanta. It happened to small towns in Florida and Texas. And then you say... Um, send Emma over here a thousand Bitcoin or you'll never see your data again. And some, some groups give an in to that. And, you know, others say, keep my stuff. I'm going to go rebuild my system. That's what, what uh, Baltimore did. And we play this through in the documentary. Now, the concern about TrickBot was that while it's been used against cities and towns, it's never been used against election systems but it could easily be used against those registration systems. So both U.S. Cyber Command and this Microsoft group that was using court orders around the world acted independently to try to disrupt the TrickBot network in the weeks before the election, thinking that it would be better to take their infrastructure down and make them force, force them to try to rebuild it uh, rather than risk having them turn it on uh, election systems. And that's what's going on right now. And it's a pretty interesting moment in the cyber conflict wars. That does sound interesting. Um, more of it does. It's really fascinating, even if it is, uh, it is kind of alarming. But this is the world we're living in. Um, and really, thank you so much for coming on the show, David, and for uh, talking to us about all of these issues. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Emma. Great to be with you. And to our listeners, go and watch David's new HBO documentary, The Perfect Weapon, released this past Friday. It really is terrific. And you can always find more of his excellent reporting in The New York Times. Hi, everyone. My name is Farshad Farahat. I'm an Iranian-American writer and actor and a member of the Plowshares Fund Board of Directors. Join me on Monday, November 2nd for Unmute Yourself, a Zoom happy hour series hosted by Plowshares Fund. Stephen Miles from Win Without War, Cassandra Vranka from Foreign Policy for America, and myself will be talking about militarization and the impacts of this political process on our relationships here at home and abroad. This is the most important election of our lifetime. The future of a foreign policy grounded in your priorities and your values hangs in the balance. So grab a drink and join us Monday, November 2nd, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. You could register at plowshares.org. And now, everyone's favorite nuclear Q&A segment where I decide to jump the line and ask Tom a question. Tom, are you ready for this? I am, Michelle. Thanks. Tom, New Start has been in the news a lot the last few weeks, but we're all focused right now on just the, the current events. My question, what are the first three things a new administration should do on arms control? Uh, great question, Michelle. Thanks. Um, I think the top three things a new administration should do is first extend the New Start Treaty uh, if it has not been extended by January 20th, and it certainly seems that the Trump administration is not moving towards extending New START, unfortunately, with the deal that fell apart last week. 
uh, with Russia. Uh, but also the good news is that it looks like the Trump administration cannot withdraw from the treaty without the next administration having the opportunity to reverse that. Uh, so a new administration, job one, come in, extend the new START treaty. A new administration would have about two weeks to work on that with Russia before the treaty would, would expire. And then once the treaty is extended for up to five years, they could follow on it. The second thing a new administration should do is get back into negotiations with Iran on the Iran nuclear deal. Of course, this is something that um, the Obama administration negotiated, the Trump administration withdrew from unwisely, uh, and that has only driven Iran closer to a nuclear weapons capability than they were when the United States was in the deal. So the United States needs to get back in the deal. Uh, and once the deal is reestablished and up and running again, can think about uh, a follow on agreement to make those procedures uh, and inspections and restraints even stronger. The third thing a new administration needs to do is, is look at the budget overall, um, the Pentagon budget, and as part of that, the nuclear weapons budget. I think a new administration is gonna have a huge inbox of things it's got to do from coronavirus uh, to climate change, to racial injustice, to fixing the economy. Uh, you know, these things are gonna cost trillions of dollars. And what we need to do is stop spending money on things that we don't need and make us less safe. And so this is time for the a new administration to look, for, for example, at nuclear weapons spending and particularly the $260 billion that's slated to be spent on a new ground-based ballistic missile. Uh, we don't need this weapon, and I think that money could be spent uh, much better on any of those other higher priority areas. Another week, another question. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. And remember, if you would like to get your question answered on the air, tweet or DM us at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Zender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Zender. Audio engineering by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.